East Asian foreign ministers prepared to meet in Seoul, showing that, hey, they actually can work together. The Philippines continue to press China on reclamation in the South China Sea, and Seoul says that North Korea hacked its nuclear reactors. These stories are coming up next on the Asia Brief. Hello everyone, a very pleasant Wednesday, March 18th morning to you. My name, of course, is Steve Miller, your host, and let's go ahead and get started with our very first story. Now, while the leaders of Japan, China, and South Korea may not be able to really stomach being in the same room with one another, coming up next week in Seoul, the three foreign ministers of these nations show that work can actually, well, get done. The 7th South Korea-Japan-China Foreign Ministers Conference will take place in Seoul on March 21st. It's the first meeting of this kind in nearly three years. The heads of state between the three nations have yet to meet jointly, the last one taking place in 2012. South Korea's Foreign Ministry spokesman No Kwang Il says, The trilateral summit meeting should be preceded depending on outcomes of the meeting between foreign ministers. However, we hope the summit will be held. Japan's chief cabinet secretary, Yoshihide Suga, says, We also attach importance to this, and that we also hope that this meeting of Sino-South Korean Japanese foreign ministers meeting can also bring about a summit of our leaders. Now keep in mind that South Korea's President Park geun has yet to meet with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in a very formal, lengthy, state-level meeting. Yes, they met very briefly with Obama in the middle, but that was about it. Park said there's no point in meeting until Abe and Japan change their outlook on history. And quite frankly, that's not going to happen. But this whole trilateral meeting does raise a very interesting point. That when it comes down to brass tacks, these three nations can put aside their historical differences and their grievances to actually get work done. It also raises another question. Was U.S. Undersecretary Sherman right that it's very easy to vilify a former oppressor for cheap political gain? If you ask me, Perhaps one of the most important areas to keep an eye on to make sure things don't spiral out of control isn't the Korean Peninsula. It's the South China Sea. Remember, in 2013, China unveiled the Nine Dash Line, which it says gave ownership to the area to them. Last year, the Philippines took China to the permanent court of arbitration in The Hague over its land reclamation and territorial use of that Nine Dash Line. China fails to recognize the court's jurisdiction to adjudicate matters such as these. And now the Philippines is pressing its case further. The Philippines sent an additional 3,000 pages of content to the court, bringing a total of over 7,000 pages that have been submitted so far. Foreign Affairs spokesman Charles Jose says, The Philippines is confident that its answers to the tribunal's questions leave no doubt that the tribunal has jurisdiction over the case and that the Philippines' claims, including in particular its claims concerning the Nine Dash Line, are well-founded in fact and law. And that is great for the Philippines. But remember, China doesn't recognize its jurisdiction. And when they signed the Code of Conduct back in 2002, they didn't agree to arbitration. So what avenues are actually left to countries like the Philippines? Mark Kozad with the RAND Corporation. But I think as countries start seeing that they have fewer and fewer options, particularly for the Philippines and Vietnam, they're going to start pressing their claims more actively in the international community. And I think the impact that that could have is that it could make China even more aggressive in attempting to uh, convince those countries that that's not in their best interest to do that and it's not in the interest of stability. Like I said, this particular issue bears further watching, and that's why on Friday's Asian News Weekly Podcast, I'll be taking a closer look. Last year, South Korea's nuclear reactors were hacked, and now Seoul says North Korea is the culprit. This comes less than one week after the hacker, or hackers, released information online. 
Seoul Central Prosecutor's Office says the malicious codes used for the nuclear operator hacking were the same in composition and working methods as the so-called Kamuski that North Korean hackers use. The cyber attacks were made between December 9th and December 12th of 2014, using nearly 6,000 phishing emails sent containing malicious codes to 3,571 employees. Now, if true, this once more demonstrates how skillful North Korea is at using cyber warfare to its own gain. Now, coming up at noon today on Asian Now, I sat down with Bruce Bennett from the RAND Corporation to discuss North Korea. And one of the topics that we talked about was the use of cyber warfare by the DPRK and why during peacetime it becomes such an effective weapon. Well, my friends, those are all the stories for today. I hope you'll take a moment to leave your thoughts in the comments on Facebook or Twitter. To keep up with more news from the region, please follow Asian News Weekly on Facebook or Twitter. You can also send an email to the show with your questions, your comments, or your feedback. Just drop a line to podcast at asianewsweekly.net. And if you have any thoughts about the stories, please send an audio clip or a video response. If you enjoyed today's program, please share it with your friends. And if you haven't yet, subscribe. It's absolutely free to do, and you can do so here or in your favorite podcast application. All right, my friends, that is it for me today. Thank you so much for taking the time out to join me. My name is Steve Miller, reminding you to be true to yourself and always be awesome.